Welcome, everybody, to the David Rubenstein Distinguished Lecture. Uh, our uh, lecture tonight is with Paul Farmer on the topic of the future of global health equity. And Paul Farmer, many of you, he doesn't really need an introduction. He has a long history uh, together, uh, working together with Duke, uh, serving on the Board of Trustees. And so we're so pleased that he's come here to join us tonight and share some of his insights with us. Uh, the, the Rubenstein Lecture is endowed by David Rubenstein, who also doesn't need an introduction. Um, and David actually will himself be here on the 13th of April to give another David Rubenstein Lecture. So I hope you'll come out for that as well. I'm Judith Kelly. I'm the Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. And our mission at the Sanford School is to improve lives through teaching, research, and engagement. And so uh, uh, Paul Farmer's life really is a testimony to everything that we aspire to as a school. And I had the privilege earlier today of uh, recording a podcast with Paul Farmer. And uh, I think you're in for a treat today. Um, his life really is a story of ways that we can have an impact, a real impact on the world when we work together with other people. Um, our lecture tonight is done in collaboration with the Duke Center for International Development as well as the Duke Global Health Institute, so I thank them for their partnership. Uh, I would like to welcome now onto the stage uh, Paul Farmer and Manoj Mohanan. Manoj is an associate professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy, and he's a scholar of, uh, of public health, and he studies the delivery of health care in a developing country context, and he's actually joining us today uh, from his sabbatical in India, so I'm very pleased that he's made this journey just to be with us today. And Manoj... Uh, uh, studies, uh, one of, some, of, some of the things he studied uh, in, include what, uh, what is termed the no-do gap, which is about how in India and other contexts, uh, even if doctors know uh, the right treatment, they may not always be prescribing it. So this, uh, this idea that there's a gap between what we know and what we do, which incidentally also uh, describes my relationship with chocolate, but I don't think that's what he had in mind. Um, <laughs> uh, so welcome, Manoj. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've already shared with you a little bit about Paul Farmer's uh, impressive resume. Uh, Paul Farmer is a medical anthropologist and a physician, and he really has dedicated his life to improving uh, the health of people around the world. He is uh, the founder of Partners in Health. Uh, he also is a, uh, a, a medical doctor at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, he has an appointment at the um, Brigham's and Women's Hospital in Boston. Both of these places he holds leadership positions. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he also has just uh, uh, helped co-found a new university in Rwanda, and on and on. I could go on, and if I kept going on, there would be no distinguished lecture at all, because you would just listen to me. So I'm going to stop, and welcome to the stage uh, one more time, if you would please uh, uh, give a round of applause for Mr. Paul Farmer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, for that warm welcome. And um, hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And Paul, thank you for giving us this opportunity to have you here. Uh, when Judith asked me if I'd be willing to come all the way from India, I, it did not take me even uh, maybe a few seconds before I said, yes, this is a wonderful way to come meet you and uh, be here. Um, and I well, I hesitated more than a few seconds <laughs> because I was scared about talking in Page Auditorium. Yeah. Well, I, I hear this is where you'd come and uh, come for a rock concert. So yes. now we have an audience that that's befitting for a rock star. So this is great. 
Um, I, I was telling Mary. I know that John Bolton was the last speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so since you, you came just last night from Rwanda, let me start from, uh, from there. Um, you've been working in Rwanda for a long time, and you've, you've also been, you are the chancellor and one of the co-founders of the University for Global Health Equity. So when we start with that, can you tell us what it is, what it really means to have a university that's focused on global health equity? And more importantly, what, what do we, as Duke, learn from, from what you're doing at, in global health equity there? Well, first I should say that um, to be the chancellor is just a, it's a figurehead role. That was to make you laugh, but <laughs> it's also true. The real, the real leaders are also people that you know, and I, I, I will take a, just a second to mention uh, Agnes Benaguahu, who you already know, who's a, a pediatrician. She was Minister of Health of Rwanda for five years, and she led the National AIDS Program before that. Um, we're just a, a great and inspiring figure. Um, the Dean uh, of the School of Health Sciences is a baby Bekele, who's a Ethiopian surgeon, and they have uh, assembled a terrific faculty, but the students are reason enough um, hmm. to, to be excited about it. The, 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 logic behind, the logic behind the university, I, I would just say as a participant, one of many participants was, you know, if you could remake the modern university, um, you know, you think about this university, which, you know, did so much for me. How can you have a great university, um, whether it's in Boston or here or anywhere, where there's, let's say, Jim Crow or, you know, you really can't. You have to have a university based on inclusion or it'll never be a great university. And uh, so part of the answer to our rhetorical question, what would it look like to redesign a university focused on equity from the beginning, from the get-go? That was really the driving logic. Um, and uh, you know, obviously you need to find resources to build a campus. You have to decide where it's going to be sited, what its primary activities were, are going to be. And that, that was an, ex uh, well, exciting might not be the right word, but it was an exciting prospect. But again, I think the real, uh, the real function and meaning of it really was revealed by uh, the students them, themselves, and they, you know, they come from all over the world. The the medical students are all from Rwanda, Rwanda, mostly young women, but but they'll be from all over in in due time. And and uh, I'm mentioning I'm mentioning the university because you let me mention it. But I hope that uh, people here, uh, students, faculty, staff, will think of uh, the University of Global Health Equity as part of our network, your network. Um, and, uh, you know, I've never been able to say that before. I can't say, well, I want you to think of Duke as your university, or I want you to think of Harvard as you, your university. Mean, I'm not authorized to say that, but it right. feels really cool to be able to say that about <laughs> a university. Even as co-founder, you're not? Dude. I am allowed. Oh, yeah, and I'm saying it. You're all welcome. Come join us. Excellent. Well, I, uh, I'm getting some amens here, and I love it. <laughs> Um, just continuing with Rwanda. I'm, not, I'm getting less nervous, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> hey, John Atori. Very soon you, you, can, you can pick up the mic and start singing. You know. I will. There you go. John um, Bolton and I are doing a duet in about five minutes. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> um, so, so continuing with Rwanda. Poor Manu, she comes all the way back from India and doesn't and know how to handle I, the... I can't, I, can't do, I can't do duets. I can only do solos, yeah. Um, so, so one of the things that Rwanda in global health has, has, Rwanda has managed to do a lot in terms of improving its health outcomes, health service delivery, and has got a lot of attention for that. And much of the attention also partly is because of the work you've been doing in the health space in Rwanda as well. So when you step back and, and the global health audience looks at Rwanda, what, what do you think are the challenges in A, adopting the lessons from Rwanda, and, and scaling it up to the global context. And if, you, if you'll indulge me, I think I should also point out to the audience that Rwanda is not exactly a tiny country, right? It's, it's a, with a population of about 13 million. It's the median size 
of all countries in Africa and also all countries globally, about that's roughly the median size of a, of a developing country. So lessons from Rwanda can be transported, mm -hmm. but how and, and what challenges do you, do, you, do you think we might face in, in adopting some of these? Um, can I tell a joke first? Please. No, it's not a joke, but I, as you're like singing my praises, I, I just came here from Rwanda and a, a Rwandan, let's just say an eminent figure there. Mm. It wasn't Agnes because she was out of the country, but anyway, it doesn't matter who it was. Uh, the day before yesterday, he or she, I'll just say he or she said, Paul is never right. Just as a statement. That, that hurts, you know. I'm right sometimes, right? Just by chance. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, how do you transfer lessons from one place to another? I mean, uh, all of it, you do this, I do this, you, did, you did does this. You know, you, you try to say, well, what is the specific and what is the generalizable? Mm -hmm. And I say you. I mean, Rwanda is in a special position because in in, in my, at least in my experience on that, on that continent beyond, people are starting to know, as you said, about Rwanda's progress and really reversal of, of, of trends. Um, you know, over the last, since, since the genocide, um, and this is not something that we talk about that much in the course of our everyday work in Rwanda. I mean, we don't, I don't. Yeah. Um, and in, since that terrible time, uh, Rwanda has sustained amazing progress, whether you look at the standard measures that we all do, infant mortality, maternal mortality, juvenile mortality, case fatality rates from certain illnesses. Rwanda has shown the steepest declines in mortality ever documented anywhere at any time. So already, you, just this basic fact, if it is a fact, and I think those numbers are pretty well vetted and they come from multiple sources, but if that's a fact, you know, one of the things that the university and its faculty and its students are also examining is what accounts for that improvement. Mm -hmm. And of course there are local variations, one district to another, but you know, th this is a, a field of study uh, that in a way is new because it, it, it's not just epidemiology, biostatistics, it's really asking what impact does care delivery, prevention, how, how do these uh, account for these changes or not, right? There, there are lots of other possibilities, but the actual study of that is, is part of what's going on now. Right. The lessons, you know, I could just choose as an example. Um, if you compare, uh, let's say, outcomes for a, a patients who are diagnosed with HIV disease, and those who are started, you know, you've written about this yourself, the, this cascade, people are diagnosed, started on therapy, how many have evidence of improvement, uh, viral suppression in this case, a year out? Rwanda outperforms uh, an urban American cohort very significantly. significantly. So, let, let, let me put it another way. The outcomes of AIDS therapy and tuberculosis therapy are better in Rwanda than in an urban American setting. So there would be, if we can say why, and I think we can start to say why. Well, it's a publicly funded program. It, can, it has social supports, and it's delivered with the help of community health workers. If those are three reasons, and again, their order may be disputed, then why can't we do that here? Why don't we have uh, a robust cadre of community health workers here in the United States to help us with help us and people living with chronic medical conditions, which is really a very substantial chunk of the world's population, and uh, and that's something that we've been we've been trying to do is take some of those successes and you know whether you call it reverse innovation or something else, how do we take some of the lessons learned there and apply them here? And uh, you know, I think that, again, this is another avenue for action, but also for study. How well does that work? The translation. Yeah, and, and, and again, what motivates, what motivates uh, providers, whether they're physicians, community health workers, nurses, what motivates them and how do we sustain, yeah. how, how do they 
and we sustain those efforts. Uh, again, I think these are, whether we call this implementation science or delivery science or uh, whatever term we may use, uh, it's, an, it's an important area of study and not one that, not one that we studied you know, in graduate school or medical school, at least I, I didn't. You know? yeah. No, and, and something around provider motivation is very much something that I've been pushing and pursuing myself. Um, and I do have a question around that, but, I'll, but I do want to go back a little bit in, in your response. You talked about how Rwanda in particular has been seeing dramatic improvements. Um, in terms of health outcomes, whether it's fertility rates, child survival, and so on and so forth. Um, even globally, we've seen many of these improvements, yeah. yet we, so, we find ourselves we are far short of our, the sustainable development goals. Yeah. And one of the possible reasons why this has not happened is that um, there's, there's this problem in where people receive health care and what kinds of health care. So, when I, when I talk to policymakers, especially in countries like India, where about 70% of people receive care in the informal sector, mm. the challenge has been the traditional public health push has been to say, let's train more doctors and send more doctors into rural areas. Mm. While the reality is about 70% of people receive care from the informal sector. And so this, this divide is really hard to bridge right now. Yeah. And, and one possibility has been to try and upscale, upskill, sorry, the community health workers or the local healthcare providers, but we faced a lot of resistance from the standard medical establishment yeah. who says they, they actually feel threatened. Like yes. the, the MBBS, MD doctors feel threatened when you say, let's go in with community health workers or low-skilled workers to deliver care because, frankly, you don't need five and a half years, six years of medical education to deliver basic health care, yeah. which can save lives. Right. And, and have you... You know, I, this, this experience... Um, I mean, just, just to be anecdotal, is that permitted in Page Auditorium? No. Yeah, you need anecdotal. a regression. I you need a, yeah, I need a permission slip. Um, yeah, I, was, I, was, I, was at, I was at a, a conference in, uh, how typical is that as an opening statement by an academic? I was at a conference in Kampala, Uganda. It was on mental health, um, and, uh, you know, I was... A, schlepping back to Rwanda from somewhere. And, um, you know, I gave a presentation um, not about any specific mental health problem or epilepsy, but, you know, that was the, the chart. So I was using the example, this is about 10 years ago maybe, mm -hmm. I was using the example of HIV care in Rwanda, and, you know, which requires, as, as I'm sure you know, a, a permanent you know, requires ongoing therapy. It's not, it's not like diabetes or major mental illness often, often do. And I was doing, you know, presenting, doing my shtick, as they say in scholarly terms. Mm -hmm. And um, a professor uh, from, I remember he was from Nigeria. Um, and I think, I think maybe a professor of neurology. Mm. Uh, and I was making a pitch for community health workers and upskilling and them as well and, and, and supporting them more. And uh, he got up and said, well, you know, this is all very well and good for you to say about uh, rural Africa, but you would never advocate that for your own country. And I said, oh, well, here's my chance to say, oh, yes, I would and do, right? This is meant to be not a, this is meant to be a prescription for chronic medical conditions, which again, most of what we see, at least I'm an internist, so yeah. I would say 90% of what I see are, yeah. are not acute injuries, but chronic problems. And, uh, and, and that is the guild mentality that you're describing, yeah. is it's been threatening to professionals, some of them, um, which is uh, bizarre in a way, because it's not like uh, community health workers are really angling for the jobs of, yeah. you know, subspecialist yeah. physicians. And uh, I, th I think this is just something, that was 10 years ago, I think it's better now, I think it'll be better in coming years, there'll be more understanding of how community health workers fit into a system. Right. And I, I'm personally, I said this to you did er earlier, I'm actually a tertiary care subspecialist who works, all the patients I say are in hospitals. Right. Right? The advocacy for community-based interventions and community health workers yeah. is not based on my interest or my experience or my clinical practice, yeah. but on the need 
uh, for us to have a, an effective response to chronic ailments. Right. And, and some of the ongoing innovations in care delivery, whether it's through telemedicine or franchising models which work with some of these community mo uh, health workers, have a lot of promise. But the adoption from the medical establishment has been less than what you would hope. Yes, uh, so, so far. But I, I, I'm an eternal optimist about yeah. this. Yeah. You know, if you can keep showing, of course, it's frustrating to have to keep showing something that's yeah. obvious. But if you can keep showing, like, let me, you know, what I, what I should have said to that neurologist was, you know, you have patients with epilepsy. They, to, to, to you know, ep epilepsy, as you know, but maybe not everybody here knows, is a highly lethal disease in much of the world. Deaths by drowning, burning, you know, it's just an awful thing. And yet, if you're on therapy, anti-seizure medicines, you don't have seizures. Right. And there have been studies, one of them done actually by a Kenyan colleague. He just took an X number, he's a neurologist, he just took X number of patients with a diagnosis of epilepsy seen in a Nairobi neurology clinic. So that's already, the great majority of people with this disease would never have the diagnosis or be referred to a, an urban medical center. He just said, okay, of this X number of patients who are on anti-seizure medications, how many of them have therapeutic levels of the drug in their blood? Right. And uh, I, may, I may get be getting the numbers wrong, but basically what he described to us was that 0% had levels that were too high, super therapeutic. Something like 20% had appropriate levels in the blood, so-called therapeutic levels. And many of the, all the rest had sub-therapeutic levels or zero drug in their blood. So these are patients with a diagnosis, with a prescription, et cetera. And that, you know, and if you can take community health workers and say, okay, let's try this with community health workers. So whether you're looking at blood levels, adverse events, meaning someone having a, a seizure, you know, you're going to show that yeah. this is an effective model for that disease. Yeah. You know, again, it's a lot of lives lost along the way to be arguing this, yeah. but I think we have to keep marshalling the proof. And another aspect of this problem of having adequate number of doctors in these areas is the issue of migration. Yeah. Um, and we frequently hear from, especially from the anti-migration camp, saying that you know, this is, I've read editorials which talk about it as a crime against humanity, yeah. um, so on and so forth. I, I recall a conversation with uh, one of the deans of the universities in Ghana, and he was really upset about uh, migration of doctors. And I asked him, do you know about migration of engineers mm -hmm. from Ghana. Yeah. Do you, is this something you worry about? And he was like, no, I don't care. I said, maybe the problem is you don't have enough engineers. If you had more engineers and more scientists um, and more economists in Ghana, maybe not that Well, no more economists. No, no more economists. Enough of those. Uh, yeah, those guys are useless. Yeah, that's right. Um, but, but if you had more engineers to build better roads and better hospitals yeah. and better bridges, maybe you wouldn't need as many doctors, and, and maybe you would have be able to ret retain more, more doctors. He was obviously offended, but I do think there is something to be said about migration. Is yeah. We think about migration of health personnel as if it's an isolated case, yeah. but it's not. I mean, doctors are humans too yeah. who would want to go. You know, I, I, I had some epiphanies about this, um, in years ago, um, and again, a lot of the lessons that I'll mention, uh, they, they, for me, they come from Haiti, which I went to right after leaving Duke and before starting a medical school, so with zero skills and a lot of delusions about my value. Um, in fact, the first decade was like I was wasting other people's time. That's a long time to be yeah. Yeah. a failure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But this, the more recent decades were better. But, you know, I was, was not resentful, but something close to it, of the Haitian professionals who were out migrating. Remember, this is in the 80s and 90s, right? And that was a dumb way to feel. Like, why would I feel resentment that, as you said, 
professionals are humans too. At least the data suggests that professionals are humans. I'm still, to, you know, we have some, some basic research to be done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what I came to learn over the years was, first of all, the idea of um, governing where people migrate. Well, let's just say that didn't happen to my forebears from Ireland, you know. Nobody was telling, Nobody was telling them not to go. And, uh, but the idea of having forces that would prevent people from, professionals from migrating, I think that's like not only stupid, but not a really morally, ten I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't apply it to ourselves, as you're pointing out. But the idea of pulling people back to need with the staff and stuff and space, meaning clinical space, that they need, that's the way to roll on this. You know, it's like you want uh, nurses and physicians and engineers to be in a place. Well, why do we have so many of them in rural Rwanda at this university? Because we have a paid attention to the kind of things they're asking for. And they're asking for the same things that we're asking for here, you know, yeah. decent wages, good working conditions, yeah. and a delivery system that actually works. Yeah. And I can tell you, in Haiti, not only have we not lost our physicians and nurses, when they have migrated, it's been to Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, Liberia, Sierra Leone. They're working in a system, whether we build it or not, where they can be effective. And, uh, and that, to me, I have enormous uh, regret for having had that, you know, silly idea that, the, I, that we should prevent people from migrating yeah. and uh, a deepening affection for the idea of making good working conditions for the professionals so that they can serve those yeah. who need them. Actually, two comments on that. One is um, there is new research that shows on about migration in particular that one of the most productive things that we can do from a public policy perspective is let migration because when migrants come in, they're, they're the amount of productivity that they bring to the economy is many, many fold. Um, so the, the spillover effects are massive, and we are, we are seeing new evidence on that. But 15% of African American physicians in the United States are Haitian. Is that right? I think so. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's uh, yeah. enriched, I mean, I'm just taking physicians yeah. and, and Haiti, but that's obviously, I mean, I wouldn't want to run a Boston teaching hospital at Har a Harvard teaching hospital without Haitians. Wow. Bad idea. That was also to make you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how the Boston Teaching Hospital run. Do they run? Well, I mean, we I like them. I like them. You did, were born in the Brigham, I believe. No? Is it right? Her child. Your children. My father was, too. Oh. My children, too. Yeah. Sorry. I hear it's a good place. It's a good place. Yeah. Um, but the I'm still nervous about Page about Auditorium. <laughs> And you know, earlier they wanted to turn off all the lights, and, and when we were trying to trying out the light settings here, and it was going to be pitch dark there, like um, a jazz. It's better concert. pitch dark. I no, I was worried everyone nervous. would fall asleep, and I said, let's not do that. Um, but I, I was going to point out the second thing you mentioned about creating the right environment, and this is an area where sadly we don't have enough evidence. But given that in healthcare, in particular, the people who come into healthcare, the nurses, the doctors, the community health workers. These are folks who are intrinsically motivated primarily to do something different, yeah. right? When these folks are in settings that they can't really do what they are trained to do, you lose motivation. I would leave in a minute. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing is, you know, good working conditions, one, some of the things we've found, and again, I wish I could say, well, this is some master plan approved by the Sanford School and disseminated as policy. Again, a joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, to, you to, to retain, you know, our professionals. But another thing is the chance for ongoing education. Right. Not just to be trained, but to train others. You know, that's another huge yeah. factor. You build a teaching hospital yeah. in rural Haiti, say, or in rural Rwanda, yeah. rural Rwanda uh, and you see how many people you can recruit and retain. It's a lot. It's a lot. Because, you know, again, they want to be part of this process of inspiring other people, uh, taking good care of patients, and you know that happens best, I think, uh, when there is that kind of environment. Again, 
where they have decent salary, decent conditions. When, when, I, when I went to Malawi, I, uh, you know, this is 2006, the first thing that in a rural area, the first thing barrier that we ran into, there was no hospital in the district, so you could say that was the first barrier. But I've been in district free, hospital free districts before, but uh, the, there's even fewer Malawian health professionals uh, per capita probably than, certainly than Rwanda now. And uh, no one, want, you know, one of the things we heard again and again is, we will go there when there's decent staff housing. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the first time I'd heard it, yeah. you know, and uh, we built decent staff housing because we, we wanted to recruit and retain yeah. the, you know, the professionals. And in a, again, this is in a rural area with no hospital at all. So then we had to build the hospital. Yeah. But the first thing that they wanted was decent yeah. housing. Which seems very reasonable. It, it, you know, if you can get out of that mindset of, yeah. meaning if I, could, if I got out of that mindset as a, as a young professional of thinking, well, why should we bother with the housing of the professionals? We're here to serve the, yeah. the patients and the destitute sick. That, that logic is, is okay, but it's not going to be what turns the tide in terms of addressing some of these yeah. human resources for health yeah. needs. And actually, just building on that last point, here's another issue, is for a long time, global health, especially the medical aspect of global health, was involved in training physicians in developed countries like the US. And then there was the medical tourism where you would go, and I, I think Ashish Jha had a different term. Volunt no, Madhupai was using this term, voluntourism, yeah. where medical students would volunteer and go perform surgeries or whatnot and come back. Where is that but, bad? <laughs> no, it's a perfectly good idea. It's like got frequent flyer miles and hotel points. Cardiac surgery. There you go. I did that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do that, by the way. <laughs> that worked. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I, I, but so my point was, it, Madhu, it doesn't leave enough capacity that you, you can spend all your resources on training students and sending there, but it doesn't create the capacity. Yeah. The other model which you're alluding to is to create capacity for, for delivering services in local areas is not that easy to do, no. right? So there's been some notable exception. So BRAC has been doing some of that. Yeah. The university that you're talking about in Rwanda has been. Well, even, even if I may, um, to return to Haiti, and I hope there's some patience here. Um, you know, the experience of the earthquake 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I don't even like talking about it, actually. Um, still, to the say it's the 10th anniversary uh, last month. Last month. But, we had, we've, you know, by then, 2010, we'd been collectively working. I mean, this is a Haitian organization. And, um, and we had a number of, uh, we had a lot of unsolicited. I was in Haiti at the time, but I found very quickly that we had a lot of unsolicited donations, which is kind of exciting, right? It never happened to us before. And I'm talking about millions of dollars more than half of American households, I have heard, given. contributed to earthquake relief in wow. Haiti. Now, it didn't add up to what it should have, but I can tell you what, what we did, uh, again, as a collective. The training institutions of Haiti were, as you know, concentrated in Port-au-Prince, which was the epicenter of the earthquake, so they were destroyed, right? right? The nursing, the National Nursing School, the medical schools, the, the, the teaching hospitals, many of you were there or went there. And so there's no way to train nurses and doctors uh, or no straightforward way if, if the, all the buildings are lying in ruin, and they were. And uh, so we thought, you know, again, it was in between. I, I, was, I was in the quake zone seeing patients, but I knew that this money had come in, and our team felt that what we should do with it is build a academic medical center, a teaching hospital right. for nurses and doctors. And I remember the skepticism that greeted that proposal, and it didn't come from Haitians. It came from here. It came from experts. Wow. Experts in disaster relief, experts in development, experts. And, uh, and, and there was one, and this was, a, like I said, the Haitian, the, it wasn't a Haitian, no, like, 
That, does that shock you that it wasn't Haitians that said, oh no, we don't need a, no. a medical center? Of course it doesn't shock you. But there was, I don't want to specify the nationality of this person or the gender, but she was French. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, this is about six months after the earthquake, and she was, and she was in a position of great influence, oh. too great, I might add, and said, uh, well, this is not the time to be thinking of building an academic medical center in Haiti. And I went, wait. So all of Haiti's academic medical centers have been reduced to rubble. The National Nursing School, almost no third year student survived or the faculty, right? I mean, like, the whole pancaked. And, uh, and, that, and I said, well, if it's not a good time to think about building an academic medical center now, when would it ever be a good time? Right. And, you know, fortunately, we didn't need to ask her permission because donors had given us the money and the Haitians weren't against it. They were all for it. So we built the hospital. And I'm just saying that that hospital is the largest solar-powered hospital probably in the developing world, but it's also the leading trainer of Haitian physicians and nurses right. and has been you know, for years now. And again, this was uh, against an undercurrent of censorious opinion from the experts. And you know, I'm still amazed by it. Yeah. You know, I don't talk about it that much, but that's what um, that my Haitian colleague was like, eh, yeah. that's what blonde do. Yeah. Blonde doesn't really just mean white people, it means foreigners. Oh, okay. that's what that's I was going to say, say I'm exempted then. No, no, you're a blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right. But, but you look good. Uh, yeah, I told you it was about the hair. Yeah, you need to work on that. Um, I'm right behind you. <laughs> See, there's at least something I beat you to, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, so sticking with the topic on, on global health and, and what the medical school establishments could do. What do you think a university like Duke, I mean, we have a, one of the largest medical schools in the country, um, and what could we be doing differently? Well, I mean, I, I, I just want to say there's a lot that is being done right, too. Yeah. I mean, um, the engagement uh, of Duke in global health, I mean, that's for the last 15 years, or more, you know, um, you, I think you came here in 2009. Yep. Uh, that's already, and there are pe people in this audience who are on the faculty, there are students, there are staff who are deeply involved in global health. And, and that really wasn't the case when I was a student here. Mm -hmm. But that was 1978 to 82. Right. But, uh, and so that, that is, I mean, I, where there was a great deal of interest, you know, already at the time in, you know, the medical school was already a giant medical school, yeah. huge medical school back then. The health system was already enormous, but the interest in global health w wasn't there. And I'm sure it wasn't at Harvard either. It wasn't when I went to medical school th there uh, after that year in Haiti. So that's one, I just want to say that yeah. because there's a lot more that Duke could do, but I think my critique is really of the academic of the American university in general. Mm -hmm. and, it's, um, and it's a delicate thing to make this critique as a faculty member, um, but it's important to do. Uh, and I'm talking about me as a faculty member. Uh, I think American universities are so risk averse um, and their, their focus on risk, our focus on risk, is really about risk to us. Mm -hmm. And I have some news for you. Harvard is not at great risk. Yeah. And neither is Duke. Right? These are epicenters of resources that should be shared. And the risk aversion plays itself out, especially in across these national borders, right? So just 20 years ago, probably, if you looked or I already talked about my first decade in Haiti is kind of a, not a wasted decade, but I don't know that I, it was particularly helpful to the Haitians, which you is the criterion. Something. What's that? You learned something. So I learned something, right. right. But again, that's a steep, if the second decade and third decade didn't follow, that would be not a great track record. <laughs> so people are starting to get my humor. I'm in Page Auditorium. No, um, and you know, I'm just saying there's a lot of Mickey Mouse kind of 
activities that universities yeah. get involved in that they would not tolerate. Like you, you wouldn't have that at Duke University Medical Center in Durham or at the Brigham Women's Hospital or at Harvard Medical School. You know, so that, that addressing that and, and addressing that in an honest but non threatening way is a very difficult thing to do. So, you know, you, are we moving in a direction away from silly projects and, you know, hopefully harmless but silly projects, but some of them probably harmful. Are we moving away from that towards serious sustained engagement in global health equity with the E on the end? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. I think universities, but the risk aversion is, remains a, a problem, and another problem is balkanization. Yeah. By the way, I said that once at the UN, and they said, we don't use that word at the UN. It's not, it's not. Yeah, I said, okay, well then, silos, and Ann Becker from Harvard Medical School is a colleague of mine, she said, I'm from the Midwest, and I resent that. Oh. <laughs> but, but you know, you know what I mean, it's like everybody, every, in Harvard, they, they, it's even formalized, every tub on its own bottom. Yeah. Like, what the you need hell does that right? mean? To go from one department now? Yes, to yeah. Just to be schools. You need a hall pass. Yeah. Now, uh, Duke is less constricted in that it way, is. right? Because very proud of that. Duke is a, you know, the hospitals and the medical school are, are not separate. Right. Um, and I think that's a, an advantage. And uh, I think that some people like Victor Zhao, when he was Chancellor for Health Affairs, um, really tried to take advantage of his experience at Harvard. He was my boss actually at Harvard and did a lot for global health, I can tell you that, when he was Chief of Medicine at the Brigham. But when, you know, coming here there was just more, it was not every tub on its own bottom. Yeah. And, uh, and we should resist that. So Duke could do better, but it's doing better than some universities at resisting that yeah. siloization or whatever it is. Yeah. That may be an overly arcane yeah. kind of critique, but I think for people here who are on the faculty and administration, um, they know what I'm talking about. Yeah. We have to fight to tear down those walls. Yeah. So you mentioned something that relates to a point that has been something that's been on my mind, which is, you know, in health over the years, over the centuries, we've done some things that have been actually not so very good. There have been some nasty things that have happened and that have led to breakdown of trust. Mm -hmm. And so um, along with uh, several colleagues of mine, we've been developing this nascent stage of this project. Usually you shouldn't be talking about nascent ideas because someone else will steal them. But this, in this case, stealing I'm, ideas is a good thing. It's a good thing because then they can do stuff and then I can claim credit for it. Yes, excellent. So, so this is a yeah. strategy for tenure. There you go. Wait, what? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> um, but it, this idea that, of, of trust is, is, is crazy because what we are seeing now uh, is there's been an increasing breakdown in trust in the healthcare yeah. industry in, in, as a whole. So globally, on one hand, what we have is a growing amount of information that patients have, which yeah. if you believe Kenneth Arrow's 1963 work, it said was supposed to make things better. Yeah. It has made things better, but it also has meant that patients have now started questioning doctors, which yeah. didn't happen earlier. And this breakdown of trust where we see that is also in uh, the most unfortunate settings where you start seeing violence against doctors. Yeah. Is this something you've... Uh... I have not experienced that, but I, I did um, I, uh, today with students, a number of students brought this up. Yeah. Um, and I was asking, not a rhetorical question, but I... Was, and these were not medical students, but I was saying, um, actually, some of them that I met with today are high school students who've come here and are in this room, I think, right now. Who else can draw high school students to Page Auditorium? Rock stars. Yes. Um, I'm just fabulous. But John, John Bolton. Bolton. <laughs> but he'll be out in a second. But, um, you know, I was asking... Do you, should you be able? Could should you be able to graduate from a, an American medical school and not know what the Tuskegee yeah. experiment is? Yeah. And uh, I don't think you should. Um, and I no, I hope no one at Harvard Medical School gets their MD without without knowing without knowing about it and learning about it formally in the curriculum. But speaking of Ken Arrow, um, there is a an eminent. Um, she's an economist but also a physician um, who... You're talking about Marcy? Yeah, I am. I recruited her, by the way, from 
Loyola Medical School to Harvard. I'm proud of that. Nice. Okay, this woman, Marcy Alson, she did an MD, an MPH. I don't hold that against her. Um, <laughs> an MD, an MPH. She a trained PhD. in internal medicine, pediatrics, then did a PhD in economics, which, again, She's crazy, yeah. She's crazy, yeah. and then she trained in, in yeah. clinically an infectious disease. Yes. Oh, wow. oh, and she has a family. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, she went to Stanford, and again, I, I do hold that against her, but she's back she's now. Back. But she just recently uh, presented yeah. uh, to us a study that she's been working on, which is tracing the impact of the Tuskegee yeah. experiment today. On trust. On trust. Lack of trust. Now, you know, that to me is the kind, if we want to understand a lack of trust, and I'll go back to the violence against clinicians in a second, if we want to understand the impact of racism and the historical burden, um, and you know, uh, the historical burden of crimes against humanity here, then those are exactly the kind of studies that yeah. We, should, we should know the answer to that, you know, and, and, and I think she is working on, yeah. she's already sharing, sharing this widely and works with many colleagues. I think that's an important historical answer to a contemporary question yeah. about trust. But it goes even much further, right? So Tuskegee was bad and it was horrible, but there are, on a minor, minute level, on, on a sort of micro level, if you go to most developing countries in the yeah. world, a patient's experience might not be great. There's, yes. there's discrimination based on your... Um, social class or yeah. your caste, your skin color. Yeah. And that's bad enough. That creates that same yeah. level of distrust that we talked about. And it, it exaggerates the access to care, the way people come to the clinic, the care they receive, as well as how much follow-up there is, which is essentially a recipe well, for... Uh, can I give an example, though, from personal experience? Um, uh, in West Africa, with the Ebola yeah. epidemic, I mean... How many papers and commentaries, true by the way, did we read about you know, uh, the crisis of trust? And, uh, and all, the, all those things were true, um, meaning there was a crisis, there was no trust in the medical system, but there wasn't a medical system either. That was a clinical desert. So you, know, you can mistrust doctors all you want, but if you never meet one, yeah. There's nothing. And I'm saying that is the, that, that's an extreme example of a setting I've seen many times, right, where there's no, in, in, if you work in rural areas, you see it, right? You can see districts without hospitals at all, hospitals without uh, nurses and doctors. In this, in this example, again, this is just a personal experience. Um, you know, one of the things that we did, I mean, I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, there were a lot of attacks on, like there was an average of 10 attacks per month on, on the Ghanaian, in Guinea on the Red Cross, right? Wow. That's a lot, right? Uh, and I don't, I, I don't know, I can have some hypotheses to explain it, but I can just say when we were in these arid clinical deserts where everything was closed, the hospitals were closed, you know, the in one place in Sierra Leone, something like six out of seven nurses had died in the, pre in, the, in the public hospital. By the way, this is the same district where diamonds come from, the, you know, the, the blood diamonds, Koidu district. Uh, Kona district, uh, sorry, in the capital of it's Koidu. Everything's shut down, right? Um, there is no functioning hospital. It's a crisis. There's a lot of people have died uh, of Ebola a lot of care uh, providers as well. What would be the way to address that crisis of trust? I, and I, I mean, all I could come up with, all we could come up with, is why don't we go in and take care of sick people? Mm. You know, you look at the coronavirus d discussion now. Um, th containment without providing care, I don't think it works very well. I mean, sh give me an example of an epidemic, I just gave you an example of uh, Ebola, where you can say, okay, we're not concerned with the quality of care, we're just concerned with stopping the epidemic. Yeah. To me, that's like a, re that's a colonialist recipe for yeah. mistrust, and it's the one that has held sway yeah. from the late 19th century on through the 20th. 
But actually, there is a brand new paper on, that looks at accountability that speaks exactly to your point in Ebola. Um, so I do, I do a little bit of work on accountability and using community-based monitoring mechanisms to improve delivery of care and holding healthcare delivery accountable. But Andre Ladube, who and who's at uh, Chicago, and Johannes Haushofer at Princeton and others, have this really interesting paper, uh, talk about being at the right place at the wrong time, which is they were doing the study on accountability in Sierra Leone. Mm. And working with the government and the World Bank, they had managed to introduce in about 300 communities, community-based monitoring systems, and Ebola struck. So, you know, things went, it was, it was really bad. Yeah. It was really bad. It was a horrible time. It was horrible. But what they find is areas where the accountability systems were already in place mm -hmm. with community-based activity and community-based engagement, they find large, large improvements in terms, uh, rather, large effects yeah. in terms of utilization of care and the fact that people, there, there's some small mortality effects as well, but in general, even though the, the epidemic just wiped out everything, yeah. but even then, you were, they were able to see some improvements in utilization and, and how people received care. Wow. You know, even that doesn't, received care, it, I didn't, I don't know that paper, but it doesn't it's surprise. It's not even published. It's, it's, it, it doesn't surprise me, right? I mean, in other words, even that can leave a residue. That's, exactly, even, you know, in, even in the face of Ebola, having strong community mechanisms to engage people and, and sort of hold delivery accountable to improve, hopefully improve trust, um, is very promising in that case. Um, I'm a true believer, by the way, meaning in the sense that, you know, it is, it can be awfully tedious, yeah. right? <laughs> but it's mandatory, meaning, you know, that exercise and, you know, and accountability is just as good a word as any, yeah. is it seems to me mandatory. Yeah. You know, and that, that, that's how my colleagues in yeah. Sierra Leone and Liberia proceeded. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned coronavirus, and I do want to talk about it. But before we get there, I want to ask you a personal story. My mother-in-law was getting a hip replacement um, here at Duke. And as she was going through the process, we were trying to figure out what's the best place for her to go. And she's deeply distrusting of the medical system, yeah. like many other people. Um, and it was really hard to decide where to go, because her first question was, you know, which one has better outcomes? Which one is not going to fleece me on prices? Turns out these simple, simple questions in the US healthcare system are extremely hard yeah. for a patient. Um, so as we think about building trust in the system, you know, it's bad enough in Sierra Leone and India and other parts of the world, but in the U.S., where we like our own individual doctors, but we distrust the system, how does one think about building trust in this system? As a, as a doctor, you, you've encountered patients both in the developing world and here. How would you think about that? You know, I don't think the, I mean, this is a look of thoughtfulness. <laughs> now they're finally laughing. You need to stay I don't, a little I don't longer. think of this as, a, as different from the United, for the United States as from what I described in Sierra Leone mm. or Haiti or Rwanda. You know, there's something to be said for, as, a, as an antidote to mistrust, you know, shutting up and listening mm. to patients and their family. I mean, uh, and it, t it takes some discipline to shut up and listen. Yeah. Um, you'd think that if you had an MD and a PhD in anthropology, two fields where you're supposed to shut up and listen, yeah. you'd think that I would be a pro at it. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> you know, it's hard to do. And I, I, do, I do think that the pressures on American clinicians, right. and I'm gonna, I'm, by when I say clinician, I mean nurses, physician, physicians, et cetera, the pressures, the time, the, the, the pressures of a fee-for-service system, which basically we have to just acknowledge, yeah. our system is rotten in that way, yeah. you know? And that's why for your mother-in-law, you know, there's all this question about what should the cost or cost to an insurance company or her or whatever, or you, what, sh what, you know, what should it be? That already, I think, compromises trust very significantly. Yeah. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, I don't know what, how to address that, but I do think we have to say, well, the system is in part problematic because it is a fee-for-service system. 
Another is that there's not a lot of time to sit, shut up, and listen if you're being clocked, you know, and you have to type. I mean, clinicians now spend more time staring at a computer screen, right. even when they're sitting next to, not across from, yeah, the, patient. the patient. This is how you do it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, whether you look at the structural issues, which are really important to do, yeah. historical, the way health insurance systems work, the fee-for-service system in general. And, and let me say the obvious. I love working at a fancy hospital like the Brigham. Mm. I mean, we've got everything. There are, like, dozens and dozens, dozens of operating rooms. I can't believe what I was just thinking, which is, we have dozens of operating rooms, and I didn't have to build them. <laughs> I didn't have to build put in a generator with electric. Anyway, <laughs> I do think that every time I walk into the Brigham is it just appears. electricity. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, it's a great place to work, right. and there isn't a lot of pressure on the subspecialists, medical professor types, yeah. right? But you look at the system more broadly. It's got all of these structural flaws that make it difficult to shut up and listen right. and, and provide good service. I mean, again, I don't feel like that is an, a pat answer. It's just you know, the kind of thing that I struggle with and I'm yeah. sure other American clinicians do. Which basically tells me that I'm, I'm at least barking up the right tree. You are, yeah, as, as usual. As usual. No. Thank you so much. It's true. Um, ben, you mentioned coronavirus, and, and I, I know did, uh, yeah. the, there are several members in the audience who have coronavirus. Would, well, <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> Remember what I said, though: <laughs> care over control. Yeah, I'll take care of you. <laughs> and, and Brigham, why not? Right. We like I'm you. sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. No, my question actually about coronavirus is. Um, you know, the new JAMA paper that came out uh, a couple of days ago, and it, one of the things that it talks about is... The, Told you I should have read that. <laughs> <laughs> the JAMA paper. Yeah. You know what shocked me about that paper, which I yeah. haven't read yet? Tell me. <laughs> Tell me. It's scary because, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from the abstract... Um, <laughs> it's a very I, short paper, actually. It's very short. Yeah, it's it's very JAMA. Short. Yeah. Um, my idea of a short paper is like one of yours, ah, like yeah. 30 pages. Yeah. Without the That's like a piece. footnote for me, yeah. 30 pages. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it says that 26% of patients in that cohort required supportive or critical care. Is that right? I a quarter of them. Possibly. What a warm endorsement. I, I don't I mean, I'm in, the details. I'm in page auditorium citing a paper I haven't read yet. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean, <laughs> to someone who hasn't read it that carefully. You haven't either? <laughs> but uh, it, it, the, scare, the troubling thing about it, and this is why someone sent it to me this morning, um, I mean, I read the New England Journal of Medicine, yeah. not JAMA. Yeah. Um, no budget. But the, if that's true, that a quarter of the patients in that cohort required supportive or critical care. That means hospital care. So it's, it's, it, it's not in Think about that, though. What if a quarter of people in a place like Sierra Leone yeah. require, right. or Liberia? Yeah. That's why the Ebola experience is relevant to this. It is, and actually, so the part you this mentioned is, it about... It is, but I can... No, 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 you, know, you, you mentioned about containment, and I wanted to point about, uh, what, what I wanted to point out was the, um, the, the JAMA paper, what it points to is two things. Wait, you One, didn't read it. I read enough of it to have talking points. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> I've been doing this for long enough. Um, <laughs> But the point is, you needed you 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 the the, the paper essentially talks about it, it has much higher transmission rates, and we still don't have a clear idea about right. how the transmission happens. But conditional on being transmitted, transmitted, the fatality rates are not that high compared yeah. to some of the other big diseases that have been going around the SARS yeah. or MERS and stuff. So it creates this bizarre thing where you know you are worried about it transmitting a lot. But the high fatality rates, or even the complications you mentioned, this happens only among the vulnerable, the elderly populations. Folks who are 30, 40 years or lesser, 
it doesn't really affect them all that much. In fact, the young kids, the really young ones in the single digits, don't seem to have a problem at all with it. Yeah. So it, it, it's important to think about what that means because a lot of people are concerned about travel. I mean, even just within the last three, four days, I've been getting on WhatsApp all these messages from folks all over saying, do you know, should we travel as if I know anything at all? So this is my way of channeling those questions to you. should have been on a plane, you. you know, from Chigali to Durham yeah. by Amsterdam. Then you wouldn't have had that hassle. No. Wait, you were. I was London, yeah. You know, before we leave the, leave the, the, the question of transmission, um, it's, uh, it, seems, it seems that, you know, if you, and, and again, I, I'm trying to avoid jargon, um, but if you cough or sneeze and spew res, you know, respiratory droplets into the air, X number of feet away, you know, there's going to be decreased mm -hmm. risk. And the closer it is to the person who's coughing, uh, the higher the risk is. That much, we, I think, we know. So it's spread person to person. Um, and it would be great if uh, it weren't, in, if the coughing and respiratory route were not involved. But I don't know that that is likely. Mm. Right? I mean, look at SARS, yeah. um, an another, uh, at the time, novel coronavirus. Um, you know, it seems like there was substantial nosocomial transmission, yeah. meaning inside institutions. And uh, I'm, I'm still worried about young adults and children. I just don't think we know yet. The, as you would say, we don't know the denominator and the numerator yet. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think it's, it's, it's worrisome, you know, that if we have a containment approach without a focus on the quality of care yeah. and a substantial number require exactly that care, then when you get into the clinical desert in places where there isn't that, that I, th you know, I, I understand why my colleagues in Rwanda, Liberia, Malawi, et cetera, are, are very, very anxious watery. about it. You know, if it, when, when it, it comes here, we'll take care, you know, people will have that kind of care. You know, we should expect very, very low fatality rates or case fatality rates. When it gets, yeah. But I don't think that's going to be you know, true. universal. And just the difference between what's happening inside the city of Wuhan and outside, like in Korea or, some, or somewhere else in, yeah. in, in Japan, just the difference yeah. between 4% and, let's say, 0.5%. Uh, what could that be explained by? Yeah. I think it's by the quality of care. Yeah. So to, to your point, um, the state of Kerala, my home state, I always find nice things to yeah. talk about my home state of Kerala. But Everybody, uh, it's like a cottage industry. I know. How awesome is Kerala? And the food. The food. But anyway, um, so Kerala was the first state that had coronavirus cases in India. Yeah. And there were these students who were studying in Wuhan and come back. Um, but because Kerala had been doing exactly what you said, that is, they had been, had been dealing with the Nipah virus in the previous years. So they had their containment strategy down, and they have reasonably good quality of care, especially relative to the rest of India. So they were able to identify those particular cases who had come in, and all the contact tracing, and within days, they, they didn't even wait for this to break down into an epidemic to say, look, we have a problem. They didn't call it an, epi uh, an emergency. They call it a state disaster. Yeah. Because they could then start various aspects of the state machinery to keep the containment solid. Yeah. And within a week, it was, they had wow. managed to keep this under control. Like, you don't even hear about it anymore. I did and, not know that, yeah. yeah. But, I, you know, again, this is just a hypothesis. The quality of care will determine how much people trust the system, back yeah. to your original point. Yeah. Like you, you have you know, shitty medical care, there will be, a, it'll have a corrosive effect yeah. on, on trust. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so I, I think we are getting close to time when we need to hand over questions to the audience. So um, we have three mic runners from the, who are from the audience who will be taking questions and um, I'll- That sounds like a cool movie, mic runner. Mic runner, yeah. Actually, that is. Is that right? Yeah. We could direct we do that. that. Yeah. Um, I'll so star in it. Before, before we uh, turn it over to audience questions, I have a request that we keep questions framed as questions 
not wait. We're in a university. No one's going to do that. But we have to try. We have to try. Um, and yeah, short questions as much as you can. So also we... impossible. Yeah. All right. I think we have one question already waiting. And go ahead and please introduce yourself and tell us who you are before um, you jump into the question. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. This was really interesting and gave a lot of different. Um, food for thought. So one thing that I was wondering about, picking up on the issue of structural issues that you mentioned, so in the context of what the future of global health equity will look like, what do you think are some of the ways that we can move beyond, you know, you had mentioned, of course, the first step is thinking about the, you know, historical honesty of what has led to some of these inequities that contribute to, for example, a culture of mistrust, specifically in the case of the um, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So, you know, the first step is recognizing that, acknowledging that, you know, speaking that. But what are other ways that we can move beyond that? Just acknowledge. Well, that. I, I just want to say um, about that assertion that um, I have never seen it happen. Historical accountability, meaning uh, that that would be novel. So, you know, I, we, we, before we move beyond it, I mean, I, I still think it would be a minority view to say that the Ebola epidemic in West Africa is related to the wars, is related to the colonial history. You could say, well, what about Liberia? That wasn't a colony. Yeah, it was. It was an American settler colony, right? So. You know, you don't, I, I, I didn't push that exercise. And like if I started, if I'm seeing patients in an Ebola treatment unit and I start saying, well, let me tell you about the history of the British in Sierra Leone, that would not be a good timing for a historical lesson. But I don't think it's been done. So I, I do wonder how, you know, beyond that, that would be, that would still be a, an important wish. The, the, back to the pragmatics, though, is like, how do we build out, that's what they say here, build out. How do we build out health systems? And it's, it's not rocket science, right? I mean, staff stuff, space and systems. I would say, OK, get the, you want to you wanna address the recent epidemic? Well, if it was a clinical desert before the epidemic, and 200, just in Sierra Leone, I think it was 211 doctors and nurses perished of Ebola just in that, those two years, including a number of, uh, a couple of friends of mine. Um, and, you know, so it's worse afterwards. And there was this big influx, uh, Madhu Pai would have a lot to say about it, and probably has, big influx of, of assistance, and then boom, uh, you know, everybody left. So another thing is, is that really the best way to respond to an emergency by addressing the emergency and then leaving? Disaster relief organizations seem to believe that, but I do not. I think, you know, there, there are lots of resources that go into disaster relief organizations. I told you about our experience in Haiti. We weren't even a disaster relief organization, and people sent us unsolicited donations after the earthquake. And that happened with Ebola as well. And those resources, human resources, capital, they left as soon as it was uh, seemly. And it wasn't seemly to, to the Sierra Leoneans or Liberians. I can't, I don't speak for Sierra Leoneans and Liberians, of course, but I'm saying I can hear what they're saying, you know, in the, when the clinical desert is as arid as it, as it was. Hey, Peter. I just saw one of my professors, sorry. It does grab you when you see one of your undergraduate professors. So I, I think, I think, uh, I think we, we really ought to keep, no matter what it is we're doing on the pragmatic side or the implementation side, we still ought to try and keep that historical um, pr process going forward. I mean, it, 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 it's really being demanded, I think, back to the point of community accountability. It's what we hear a lot of is why you know, what happened? Why did everybody leave? Where did the money go? Of course, they blame their own government, which is very convenient to the international players who did have the capital. It wasn't the, it wasn't the Ministry of Health. And they're the ones who, who got blamed. And I think setting the historical record correct, even on this recent, you know, score is important. 
Anyway, it's not what I do is to go on and on about the history of, of a problem, but it's important to do as well. I think. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My By the way, when the lights went up and then I could see my hey, professor's Paul. faces, it, it would have been, I'm glad they didn't go up. Until... Hey, Paul, Laura Hemmick. How are you, Laura? Um, good, how are you? Char Heel. But um, here I am at Duke. Um, I have so many questions. Thanks. It's great to see you again, and welcome back to see North you. Carolina. Um, I'd like to put myself in, in the spot of a lot of students here and thinking about the future of global health. We've talked a lot. There was a great conference here a couple of weeks ago about the need to decolonize global health. Yeah. Uh, so what's the role for students who are graduating with degrees in public policy and public health and really want to work globally and want to give back? Yeah. It's, it's very different than it was way back when yeah. I did my MPH. I, th think. I, think, I think it's different and, and in so many ways better. And I certainly, by the way, I understand and I, I spoke with some students today who are asking very pragmatic questions. Yeah, but what should we do? And, uh, and I think those are, I mean, it's important to be pragmatic. And I think this gets, gets to, to your point. Um, you know, if, 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 uh, if people who are graduating now or people who are students now can move forward the discussion, um, in an honest manner, and you know, you've seen this over the years as I, as I have, and think about the problematic nature of global health without the E on the end, equity. Like I don't even say public health anymore, I just say global health equity, if that's what I mean, right? And you know, we never heard that when we were, you know, uh, we were studying this topic, and I think we should insist on it, because the traps of public health paradigms in general are, are significant and real. Um, and in fact, in many ways, they're more treacherous than being a nurse or a clinician is, you know, public health. In, in public health, there are too many Luddites who are willing to say, well, there's nothing that can be done. It's not cost effective, not sustainable. And I think graduates of programs today should be suspicious of that logic, which is really neoliberal logic under various guises. And again, not something I heard as a student. Um, I was mostly a student at the medical school, but that didn't mean I, I didn't go to the School of Public Health as well. And, and, and I think embracing that, owning it, and uh, pushing that uh, agenda of equity forward within various forms of public health, clinical practice, the, the big bureaucracies, you know, aid bureaucracies. Um, you know, and I'll name them, like USAID, the World Bank, um, the largest NGOs like MSA. You know, having those messages inside those organizations will be a very welcome development. And I, I, think, it, I think that's the future of global health, is global health equity. And that comes with the, the younger generation. I mean, that may sound uncharacteristically rosy, but I mean it. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Um, we have a question up top. Um, and I would request also audience members who have questions to please find our mic runners. We'll keep alternating between them. So yes, please. Good evening. My name is Katie Grimes. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Laura, for that question. It was the perfect segue to mine. Um, so I'm curious, based off of your experience, what do you think NGOs should be doing, or yeah. how should NGOs be behaving in order to better contribute to global yeah. health equity, knowing that the way that the system is set up, we are so concerned with reaching our targets to make sure we receive yeah. funding to continue helping yeah. um, while, you know, having worked in an NGO for the past 10 years, or a few NGOs for the past 10 years, speaking with local stakeholders, there is such a frustration yeah. that you don't have a voice yeah. with how the system is set up. So how should NGOs be? Well, you know, I, I, again, a, a formula would be hard to apply you know, in the places I've worked, which are, which are quite varied, right? A Siberian prison, a rural squatter settlement in Malawi. But I think there, I'd be willing to go out on a limb and, and say something that I think 
NGOs could do. I mean, we're sitting in an NGO. Last I checked, Duke University is a non-governmental organization. And so is Partners in Health. And so, but you probably weren't talking about the university, but so I, I'm talking about the same thing you are, the, the NGOs. I think that if I look at our experience in Haiti and Rwanda, again, it's a, over a long time and with many thousands of people, one thing that you could do in any place is to support a public sector safety net. And that sounds so damn nerdy, right? But what does that mean? Well, in the first 10 years, the ones I was being dismissive of, my first 10 years in Haiti, uh, what, 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 what changed was not me, who cares, right? I mean, I care, but, and I hope you do. I know Laura does. <laughs> but uh, what changed was that we started focusing all of our energies on strengthening the public sector in Haiti. So all those hospitals from the Dominican border to the, co the West Coast that Partners in Health sister organization are involved with, they're all public facilities. Um, and that, that, would be a, that would be a big shift for most NGOs, right? Who, as you point out, are concerned with their own metrics and their own donors. But I can just say uh, Partners in Health would not be a large organization without having made that shift. And we wouldn't have been invited into Rwanda anyway, you know, which was we were invited there specifically to do that. And I'm not saying it's the only thing to do, I'm, but even if you're, let's say you're a missionary group, there's no law, at least none that God handed down, she speaks to me personally, there's no law that says a missionary group can't support the public sector, right? Um, there's no law that says a non-governmental organization can't support a public school or a public clinic. And again, I think it would rattle a lot of NGOs, but probably not as much as you'd think. You know, it's a way to reach a lot more people, certainly. Um, and, you know, again, that's not a formula because it's different to be in, let's just say, Siberia in the late 90s than Siberia in the late 80s. It's different to be in Siberia than in rural Malawi. But in both of those instances, you know, I, I, I've seen the power of, of working with those responsible for the public well-being, and that, that, that's the public sector. And now this from someone who's never worked, I mean, I've, I've never even worked for Partners in Health, but I certainly don't work for a government. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, my day job is at Harvard, right? But that doesn't mean I can't you know, look to our colleagues in ministries of health and say, hey, how can we be useful to you? And again, it might not be by doing work only in a public hospital. Of course not. I wouldn't be so prescriptive. But saying that to your beleaguered colleagues in a ministry of health, hey, how can we be useful to you? I think more and more NGOs should do that. And, and by the way, and I know this is longer than you want, but I tried to say that quite a bit after the earthquake in Haiti. And um, I didn't get a lot of applause. I mean, I think my Haitian colleagues were happy, but saying that directly to the larger NGOs and contractors was not a was a personally unpleasant experience for me. You know, because I I got shouted down. I was like, I'm not. You asked my opinion, uh, then I, I shared it. But it was it was not a pleasant experience yeah. um, taking taking on the the larger. And Gio's just saying, hey, I think we should do more to help the Ministry of Health in Haiti. It was not fun. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I have time for a thousand more questions. I mean, I, yeah. I, I flew here for this, and so I, did you. So did I. Maybe we should just stay on for... I think, yeah. No. We are both on a, on a tight leash here. John hasn't come in yet to sing, <laughs> but any second now. <laughs> Come on, I'm hilarious. <laughs> my, my name is Angela Gillum, and I'm a, a Haiti hand. I grew up there, and I run a small organization near the Dominican border. We serve about 65,000, and there is no public option. Yeah. We're, we're the only health care. Yeah. Um, I very much admire your work, by the way, and I, I, um, I, th that it's an example you know, of if there isn't that public option, thank God there are people 
holding the line clinically. And, and, and we're trying together. to facilitate it. We provide primary care, and then, we, of course, we get people to Mirabale sometimes. Um, but my question is specifically on cholera, which um, we went through in our region last year. And I was involved with the UN and on the, the national level with MSP, the Minister of Health. And the UN, who was, you know, they brought the cholera to Haiti, they were very quick to say in one meeting, well, there's not been any for 30 days, so it's, it's gone. And we know that to be not true. And we know from our region, um, when we let the, the Minister of Health know that we had a case, they came up and brought us Clorox. Um, luckily, we were a little bit better prepared than that. Yeah. But what can we do? Is there an appetite? I live in Chapel Hill, a UNC grad. Um, but what can we do as, as sort of an academic community here in yeah. the U.S. with these great resources and these great minds to come in after Ebola, to come in after cholera, when maybe the U.N. and the Haitian government is probably not that happy to talk about it? Um, how can we come in to after these huge disasters, which don't have to be a disaster, but we could come in with programs involving students? It would be a really amazing opportunity but there just doesn't seem to be a will to, to have sort of project based, for instance, cholera in Haiti or Ebola, where, where it's something that we could say as a, as a community that we care enough to come in and stay for 10 years and really make sure yeah. that it's gone. And I would love to hear your thoughts on pulling that support together, because um, that's one of, of the goals of Serve Haiti, which is, is my organization. Well, you know, first of all, I think all of these things that we're talking about are 10-year, 20-year uh, projects. I mean, I, I, you have to admit, were, were you surprised that I said, uh, my first decade, a waste for them? Uh, but I mean, there's, I wasn't just being light. I, I was trying to say, you know, how, how much does that add up to? As you pointed out, rather archly, well, you learn something. So these are all long-term, you know, uh, projects. I, I think Judith was impressed by this term I used earlier of pragmatic solidarity. Um, and I mean, again, I probably got that from the Haitians. That, you know, solidarity is, is a, not a short-term project-based affair, right? It's, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, is cultivated over, one would hope, decades and lifetimes, et cetera. Um, the pragmatic part uh, is, is difficult because there's so many Haitians who would like to be involved in these projects. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I've seen, and, and I hope, by the way, that you, your, your people you referred got, were happy with their experience in Mirabale. The biggest problem is that there are 2,000 people a day that my colleagues see there. You know, it's become a de facto referral hospital, you know, as you know, for the country. We get people from Boston, you know, Haitian Americans from the diaspora who come, come there as well. The thing, the reason I bring up Mirabale again is just because it's really all run by Haitians, right? So, you know, what, one of, you know, what is the, the le lesson there? Um, you know, I think, if you take on a project, a problem like cholera, uh, all the way to eradication, uh, it's going to necessarily involve the agency of local communities, like the ones you're working with. And uh, you know, some of the things I just didn't listen to in those first ten years, I didn't think hard enough about how to retain people through respect and decent jobs. Uh, I also don't think, again, I don't mean to personalize this, and, but you asked me, I don't think I listen enough to people saying, I would like the same kind of training, you know, formal training. And this was true of community health workers talking about credentialing, uh, you know, and this was true of young people who wanted to be nurses or physicians. And again, that was another chance to say, okay, well, what can an NGO do to offer basically a university? And as you know, in, in Rwanda, as we just heard, we ended up building one. And don't think we wouldn't like to build the same thing in Haiti. You know, a place, think of all those people you must be seeing, young people, who say, I really want to go to, you know, and then they'll name a university or it'll be in the DR, it'll be the United States. 
And I know that for me, I was trying to not hear that for a long time. And uh, I know that may seem a long way from a smallish group with a smallish catchment area, but I think it's not. And I, and I, I think, again, listening to those entreaties or whatever uh, and, and finding ways to involve uh, young people who want that kind of training in a specific endeavor like cholera eradication, um, at least that, that's been what I've seen in central Haiti is even cholera eradication um, should have room for formal, I, again, training seems like such a strange word, but for formal engagement over over long time. And I, I think NGOs, back to the, the question there, I think NGOs can do that. You know, we have, you have this connection with Chapel Hill, you know, with Duke. That's a university, this is a, a research triangle. You know, how do we match our capacities here with the aspirations there? And I don't mean to be too philosophical about it. I'm just saying that's what we've tried to do with resources in, Bo in Boston is how can we bring, and it, just one little example, uh, on the vaccine, the cholera vaccine research. Like I don't, I don't know how you'd get rid of cholera entirely without using every tool at your disposal, including vaccines. That work was, again, done with local Haitians including researchers, implementers, et cetera. But it was the first time that that vaccine had been used. And it was studied and documented. I mean, and that's the work of a university town or a place like Chapel Hill or Duke. And uh, you know, I think, again, it's a tiresome answer to a specific question. But it, it, it's been my experience that, that we, we just don't push hard enough. If there were an, a cholera outbreak in, in uh, Durham or Chapel Hill, there would be a fire alarm. T What's that? No, no one would die, and there would be lots of new knowledge generated. We should be doing that uh, in, in responding to these problems as well. Excellent. So I think uh, we are at time. So let's thank our speaker today. Paul, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, thank you.